country music listening numbers are on the rise. But while black artists dominate charts across multiple genres, country music is still considered by many to be a predominantly white space. From Johnny Cash to George Strait, Dolly Parton to the Dixie Chicks, why is country music considered so white? First, we should define what country music is. Country legend Harlan Howard famously defined a country song as three chords in the truth. I love Harlan, but I think that definition misses something. This is Alice Randall, a New York Times bestselling author, a professor at Vanderbilt University, and a prolific country music songwriter. I think that country is three chords and four very particular truths. First truth. Life is hard. Second truth. God is real. Third truth. Whiskey and roads and family provide worthy compensations. And the final truth. The past is better than the present. To me, those four truths and three chords are what define country. The black musical influence on the three chords is often acknowledged by scholars, with the roots of country music stemming from the blues and Scotch-Irish music. One way of defining country music is an Afro-Celtic form. It is black musical influences and Celtic ballad forms that come together to make country. But what often doesn't get discussed is the role that black artists have had on the four truths. Sometimes people talk about country as a white space, and I think that misses a point. America is created and seen by many people as a white space. So country seems white because to some people, America seems white. There have always been black people in country music. There's of course Charlie Pride. There's Ray Charles. And to me, and then you say goodbye. The biggest, most revolutionary country album of all time is arguably Modern Sons in Country and Western Music by Ray Charles. It's Stone Country and it's Ray Charles. And then there's what Alice says is perhaps one of the most important country songs in recent memory, Daddy Lessons by Beyonce. Daddy's little girl. You've got the evangelical Christianity, you've got the guns, you've got the sense of the road, you've got the sense of the past, you've got the compensation of family. All the things that we want to see in a great country song are there. Beyonce is a very important country artist too. But when Beyonce performed Daddy Lessons at the 2016 Country Music Association Awards alongside the Dixie Chicks, not all country fans seem to agree. Beyonce backlash. Beyonce backlash. Are you saying country is a country club and you don't want us in it? Whenever we're talking about music, we're always talking about race. This is Charles Hughes, a music scholar and a professor at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. We're always talking about how things sound black or sound white. That is almost always at least a metaphor for what we're thinking about in terms of racial politics throughout the rest of the country. Debates over integration, debates over appropriation and ownership, what whiteness means and white identity means, what blackness and black identity means. And while country music isn't the only genre where these debates take place. For several decades at least, if not from the very beginning of country music, country has marketed itself as essentially the soundtrack of white identity, trying to essentially say we're real American music, we're the music of the heartland, we're the music of the silent majority, we're the music of everyday folks, we're the music of rural America or the country people. This effort on the part of the record industry goes back not just to the beginning of the country music genre, but to the beginning of musical genre itself. When the record industry created different genre categories to market these new things called recordings, they often did so thinking very specifically about how these particular genres would be marketed towards racial or ethnic specific groups. Starting in the 1920s, black audiences were sold race records. Basically any kind of music that was created by African Americans, blues, gospel, jazz, and other things, that again was thought to be marketed at African Americans, whether they were living north, south, or wherever. 
White audiences were sold country music, or as it was originally called, hillbilly music, a genre that, despite being musically and thematically rooted in the black American experience, was very explicitly thought of as being the music of white Southerners or white folks who had recently moved out of the South into Northern or Western cities. The country music is defined, in a sense, by the belief that the folks who will be buying these records and supporting this music will be white folks. This continued into the present day. When we're talking about the music or we're just more broadly talking about those kinds of people and experiences, the assumption has been that those are white folks. Politicians have used country music to try to bolster white conservatism. Record industry leaders have talked about country music as being not just the soundtrack of white America, but as the reaction to soul music or hip hop or to the civil rights movement, etc. And yet, there is no greater demonstration of how much of a lie uh, the idea that country music is white music. There's no greater demonstration of that than the fact that so many folks who are not white love country music, right? I was born immersed in country music. This is Caroline Randall Williams, a poet, a professor of blues lyric, and a writer in residence at Vanderbilt University. In first grade, my teacher, Mrs. Ackerman, said, bring your favorite song on a cassette to school. And I brought in, all queued up, George Jones's song, The Grand Tour. Um, which, if you don't know that song, it's about a man whose wife has taken the baby and left him. If you'd like to take the grand tour. And Mrs. Ackerman called my mother and said, is everything all right? I was really just moved by narrative. For Caroline, the notion of country music as a white space would have seemed peculiar, given that... In my house, country music was black music because a black woman was writing country music in this house. In fact, not only was country music written in the house... We're sitting in a house that, to me, country music built. In part by the hit song X's and O's, performed by Trisha Yearwood and co-written by Caroline's mother. Alice Randall. This house bought by the money I made on X's and O's, a song that I'm proud to say has this line, she's got her God, she's got good wine, Aretha Franklin and Patsy Cline. She's an American girl. My daughter was that American girl. X's and O's reached the top of the country music charts in 1994, making Alice Randall the first black woman to pen a number one country record. And yet, while Alice realized early on that her daughter Caroline, raised on Aretha Franklin and Patsy Cline in a house built by country songs, is the epitome of country, Nashville might only just now be getting the message. My earliest memory of uh, country music is uh, kind of with my dad, like, because that's all my dad listens to is late 90s country. This is Stony Creek recording artist Jimmy Allen. Jimmy is one of a new class of black artists making waves in and around Music City. Only Jimmy's wave has already swept him onto the stage of the Grand Ole Opry, the mother church of country music. But years before his Opry debut, Jimmy was just a young boy growing up in Milton, Delaware, dreaming of becoming a country star. For me, country isn't about a cowboy hat. It's not about a fiddle or a steel on a song. It's about the story in the song, the lyric and, and telling the story. And, Whoever the artist is, if they grew up a country boy, country girl, a lot of us kind of have the same morals. That's what makes you a country artist. And that's what I love about the genre itself, being able to hear a country song and it quickly takes you back from the description. Jimmy made his way to Nashville in his early 20s. And after years of struggling for his career to break, his debut album was released in October 2018. The album's first single, Best Shot, reached number one atop the country music charts, making Jimmy the first black artist with a career number one country debut. And I was like, oh, it's great. But it quickly went from great to like, man, man that kind of sucks because we're 2019 and we're still talking about color. My thing quickly became, cool, how can I change this narrative to where three, four, five years from now, it's no longer a thing. It's just, boom, this artist hit number one. So if you're a black kid in this small town where your family only listens to like R&B or jazz or blues, and you might want to do country, you might think it's just something that white people are into because you don't see someone that looks like you in it. Jimmy's debut album is titled Mercury Lane after the street he grew up on in Milton, Delaware. This could be seen as a nod to his roots, and maybe too, 
as an acknowledgement of that fourth country truth. The past is better than the present is where you find the racial fault line in country and the difference between great country music, mediocre country music, and bad country music. Because looking back at the past is more than nostalgia. Superficial country songs are just looking back in some vague way at a recent past and saying it has to be better than the present. But a sense of hauntedness by the past actually creates a sense of responsibility in the present. Acknowledging that life is hard is the essence of country and it is an essence of the black experience in these United States. Which is perhaps why country often goes from being a musical form to a vehicle for something else entirely. The reason why controversies over race and country music are so powerful and are understood so immediately is because the music itself is a stand-in for a lot of conversations that we are too often afraid to have, or even when we want to have them, we don't necessarily have the language to do so effectively. You know, I was born in Detroit in 1959, and one of the first things that my father ever said to me is he wanted me to speak for those who could not speak for themselves. And one of the sets of people that I wanted to speak for are all the black people contributing so much to country music and then being told they're no part of it at all. We've always been here. <laughs>